have any connection. If they can't give you the job, tap the doors of the international agencies. You have the Danish, you, you have uh, Danida, you have uh, Swedish, so I would call them what. You have the United Nations, you have many branches of the United Nations, it's, whether it's UNESCO, whether it is United Nations Development Program, um, whether it's United Nations Environmental, whatever, whether it's all these programs, get in touch with them. South Africa, they, they want to help in South Africa because of the, uh, the condition in the past where many people were underprivileged. If you prove that you are one of the guys who is brilliant, I'm telling you, you get the funds. Even right here at the university, there's money lying in the research office there. After one year, nobody has used the money. They send them back. Because people are not working. That's why I keep telling you guys, you sit here and you want to get your credits, you will never get any money. You will never access these funds. Free money. Every single month, you earn about 30,000 rand. Mm. For what? For just driving around and looking at things, observing, studying, come to your home with a nice computer, even big screen. <laughs> Powerful, like you type, you do put all the new programs there. You even make a budget and give them, they buy these things for you. Equip you very well. But you've got to demonstrate that you have this. <laughs> Not for nothing. Climate change. Um, I want to just show something here. Pangea, the southern continent, Africa being part of it, 
I was covered by ice. That was during the glacier period. And then as time go, went on, over a very long period of time, the climate changed, and there was a warmer period, a warm period. The, 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 the glacier melted away. Up to our time, the, we don't have glaciers in South Africa any longer. So you can see it's a long term climate change. It's not something that happened after a few years it, and then we have glacier, then after that it, uh, we have the warm period and no, it is a very long period of time. So that's what we call here the uh, long term. But then we live in a modern period where we have climatic variability. We have times of flood, we have uh, droughts, we have cold period and, and so on. It's climatic variability. And modern climate change we have today, which is predicted to also go for a long term, over 50 years or even more, is, that is happening now. The modern day climate change uh, is caused by something we call global warming or greenhouse effect. That is why that's why I'm leading into this, uh, into this slide. And greenhouse effect, why do we call it greenhouse effect? Because of, wh why, why greenhouse? Greenhouse, what is the story about greenhouse? Why do we often, you have used this, over, what is the meaning of greenhouse? Yeah? I, I think it's because like, they can let the sun go through them, but they always like, when the, the sun is hit by the they can let it go to the end, but when the, the, the heat is being released by the end, they won't let it escape through the air and they are lose heat. Yes, so where does the term greenhouse come from? Yeah, from the farms. Where, what happens in the farms? The glass house, where um, you have crops, uh, nurseries are uh, in there with certain conditions of temperature and, and so on. And as, as we said, whatever is in that glass house that is sealed does not go out. So the temperature in there may be different from what we find outside. And, and, and the same thing is happening today because, as she said, those greenhouses, greenhouse gases, and what are some of them? Methane. Methane is one of them. Carbon dioxide is one of them, that is the most important one now that is causing a lot of problems because it comes up from all the refineries that we have along with us here. We have CSCs, um, carbon fluorocarbon, and, and so on. So th those gases, when they sit in the atmosphere, they, cre they create a kind of a layer that does not allow heat to go past, to escape from the earth. And so the, the heat that goes up, as you can see here, hits that layer and comes back down on the earth. So that is why it's cause, causing the, the global warming. The melting of, of glaciers that we have now, the floods that we have, the hurricanes that we have, the ex extreme temperatures that we have in certain areas, heat waves and so on, are caused because of this situation. So that is what we are referring to here as modern climate change. And it is caused because of human, this is not caused by natural processes. Most of past climate change was caused by natural processes. Natural processes are mean, for example, that in, um, we have one of, the, one of the natural causes of climate change would be um, the volcanoes, for example. The volcanoes, they let out this, this, this smoke that is sent to the atmosphere also contain the carbon and, and other gases in there that also create that ceiling. So that is natural causes, not caused by humans. Another cause of climate change is um, about the, the Earth's distance to the sun. It migrates. Um, over a very long period of time, about 23,000 years um, or so, the, the Earth distance from the Sun is either closer or further. And that causes climate change as well, amount of heat um, on, on the Earth's surface. Um, then we have something called the eccentricity of the Earth. I'm sure you must have learned these things here. The, it has to do with... Um, so, then I'm going to give you an assignment as an assignment because we can't cover it in this lecture. So, look at causes of climate change. What are causes of climate change? Yeah. Sorry? It's easy, just type in this causes of climate change, Google it, they will pull out the whole list and you will see that. <laughs> Very easy. As I said, volcanic activities, natural causes, or, in fact, make it more. Sorry? Natural causes, put it natural. Sorry. Natural causes. As I said, you have. Um, Seasonal variation, seasonal, uh, what is it called? Seasonal, not seasonal variation, I'm looking for, um, 
Okay. One of them you have is called eccentricity. And um, the Earth rotates on an axis around the Sun. So if this is the Sun here, and this is the axis that the Earth uses to rotate around the Sun, the theory is that this axis moves over a certain period, it goes a lot closer to the Sun or further away from the Sun. And over a long period of time, it stays, if it moves over here, it stays here for quite a long period of time, not just few years, thousands of years. And then after that, it moves back to here or moves closer to uh, here. So the variation of the X um, axis, uh, distance of the X axis towards the Sun and away from the Sun, that's one of the causes of natural cause of climate change. It doesn't have to do with humans. This is just the way the X is moving and the axis is moving. So this is one of them. Um, another one is uh, I was, the one I was struggling to. I'm just trying to look for it. has a name, and the name is not coming. It, it has to do with the seasonal variation of the sun angle. I think that is it. Uh, seasonal variation. Don't call it seasonal, just say variation of the sun angle. Of the sun angle. Another one is uh, solar activity. Solar activity. Solar activity. The amount of heat that is produced by the sun. It is. It is. Uh, it is theorized. There's a theory going on, a long-term theory that has been proven, actually even by climatologists in South Africa. In fact, one of the guys who proved this thing here is actually South Africa. So South Africa is also noted. We have some of the greatest brain uh, guys in the world. Um, you also see that in, in GIS, when you come to GIS, one, uh, the system method there, we call it uh, critic. Critic method, where we come to that. So what we're saying here is that even though um, in the past, South Africa was known because of the impressive form of government, but South Africa has some of the greatest guys around the world in terms of intellectuals, in terms of academia, in terms of research. Solar activity, is that the, um, the, the sun produces a, a, a certain amount of heat that changes after a certain period of time. So over, over a very long period of time, it consistently produces a, a certain amount of heat. And then after a certain period of time, what happens is that it, the, uh, that amount of heat reduces and it stays over a long period of time, so it's cyclical. So it's like a cycle. At this time period, over say 50,000 years, I'm just giving an example, don't write that about say 50 or say, let's say 10,000 years it produces amount of heat after the next 10,000 years it produces a lower amount of heat the next 10,000 years it again produces a higher amount of heat it fluctuates, it does that and that affects our climate on the earth that is natural no human is causing that in the sun nobody is going to the sun and do it, producing some fire there and causing it the sun is doing that by itself the variation of the sun, sun angle because we now know that the sun migrates to the Tropic of Can Cancer um, in the north, to the equator, and to the Tropic of Capricorn. You have the seasonal variation. You've learned about that. Um, so what happens is when the sun is here, this angle from here to here and from here to here, the angle is going to be different. And it is said that after a very long period of time, the sun sometimes stays up here for a very long, long, longer period of time or some of these areas, they stay for a very long period of time without having sun, um, sunlight here and the temperature here is affected the climate here is affected for a very long period of time and then what happens is that when, they, when the sun migrates towards this area it stays here sometimes for a very longer period of time affecting the weather here but at the same time also affecting the weather here seasonal variation so, I've just given you about three examples of uh, natural causes of climate change. As I said, you can Google and find them. But the modern climate change that we talked about are caused by today what we call anthropological causes. Human. Through what we use, our how do we cause climate change ourselves? We talked about the refineries. What else? 
sorry different deforestation very good deforestation excellent what else sorry mining mining how yeah urban urban this island yes urbanization urbanization very good some of the things that we use, what are some of the things that we use that cause also climate change? Sprays, bridges. So you can see humans, because of urbanization, as she said there, and the use of these this, this materials, that um, even though they are sprays, they have all these gases in there, and you think, well, if I use tiny spray, what's going to happen? But if 50,000 people use that spray, it's a combined effect that uh, becomes a problem. And of course, bush burning. And then reduces uh, smoke and, and sound in the atmosphere, aerosols. So those are what causes the greenhouse gases, and that is why uh, this system has been uh, this this period has been called the anthro. A certain word that is a very new word that has been coined to it. Um, forgot it. But it's a very interesting new word that has now been given to that uh, to the period we are living living in. Um, anthro something, anthro anthro something something. But anthropology has to do with humans. But they've coined it to anthro something something. Um, <laughs> so um, why I stayed longer in that slide is because I've already explained this. I feel the difference between climate, climatic variability and climate change. Um, this is just to tell you, uh, we talked about over time, this issue of climate change has been studied. These are the different researchers and um, write-ups and what people have said about climate change. When it started, the notion of greenhouse uh, effect, when did it start? It was 1820 and what has been happening up to you. Uh, now we have the Intercontinental uh, or International Panel for Climate Change and so on and so forth. We know of the Kyoto Conference, we also know of the Climate Change Conference that took place even in South Africa and so on. All of that happened along this year somewhere, 2000, so that was something actually here somewhere. So we could actually, um, from seeing some, when somebody published this stuff here, um, we can now update it by putting the conference in South Africa here. Climate change conference. Past climate change, uh, we talked of uh, long term climate change, natural changes, natural causes, we talked about uh, mechanical activity. Um, this is one of the circles, this is one of the causes that I talked about. It was discovered by this guy called Melancholis. It talks of periodic fluctuations in the amount of solar activity. Remember, I mentioned solar activity there, so it was discovered by this guy, and has been actually reworked on it by South African scientists, as I said. Now let's look at some of the techniques. Um, okay, we'll talk about the techniques later on because paleoclimatologists they are the ones who uh, use techniques to determine climate change. Paleoclimatologists. What techniques do they use? We're going to talk about that. Quite interesting. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, there are periods. One, what's the noise about? Sorry, guys, if you, if, if you are tired and you, do, you are not interested, please continue. Just be quiet. Don't stop. <laughs> there. Um, evolution of plants. Um, what did we say about the, 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 the result of plants in terms of, we said what are some of the causes of climate change <coughs> in terms of deforestation, evolution of plants. It simply is a term to say the change of plants, how plants have, have, have changed. I think the guy who did, as I said, this on my notes, I'm using somebody's notes. I would do the notes in different ways. So I'm just tiptoeing through the notes and giving <laughs> So that, that would not be a right thing. That would not be a right word of putting there. Yes, it should be um, um, climate change. Uh, sorry, sorry, not climate, deforestation. Because as we said, 
We, why do we need forests? Why is deforest, deforestation a problem? Oxygen. Oxygen. And what do they take out of the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide? That's why we need them. And that is why um, the Amazon forest today, which is the largest natural forest that we have, should be protected. That is why there's a lot of talk about protecting the, um, the Amazon forest and the equatorial forest, which is not only in Amazon, we also have most of Africa. Um, around the equator, countries like the Gabon, like Central African Republic, that uh, he was had time recently to the South African armies. Um, <laughs> but the good thing is that they, they also have, environmentally, they have the largest um, uh, equatorial forest that we need to regulate our climate. So we have those countries yeah, around this middle bed of Africa, uh, around the equator. As I said, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Congo DRC. It's Congo Brazzaville, it's Gabon, it's Cameroon, the Central African Republic. That's where you have. Um, I thought we had. Uh, if you go back to the map, the, the, the satellite map that we had yesterday, if you look at the green in those countries, you realize that it's centered around these countries. And because that has been changing due to lumbering, these countries, they cut down this forest for furniture, they export the lumber, the, the locks to Europe. For, uh, for all kinds of furniture, because in Europe they don't have these trees. So they use them for all kinds of furniture in, in Europe, and sadly sometimes they even export these things back to Africa and sell it at a very expensive, very high price. I must tell you that even in these countries, you have environmentalists that are always fighting with the government. It's so painful sometimes to go to the port and you see lots of, of wood deforestation. You can actually see a country being torn down but you don't have a voice because if you make any noise, you'll be arrested, you'll be tortured, and you don't have to make, say anything. You disappear and never be found again. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, then the forest, vegetation is evolving, not in the, not, not in the right way. Yeah. Yeah, but some of the natural changes could also occur could also occur because of what? What are some of the causes of natural change of, of vegetation? Sorry? Natural disasters? Um, what else? Sometimes some, some plants some plants because of the climate change, some plants may not be able to withstand the change condition. And so they become extinct. So they, they, they no longer exist, and they don't play the function of regulating the climate. So as I said, when tiptoeing these this notes, I would, I would change it completely different. I didn't have time to... Previously, we, when we started with geomorphology, I spent time trying to fix, fix it, and I, somewhere along the line I gave up. <laughs> I just said, look, I'm just going to keep the notes the way they are. And um, I, would, I would just like to discuss what, what I know from my own expertise. This is somebody's notes. If you bring in different lecturers here, they will lecture this thing differently. And um, that, that's my way of understanding it. I don't know exactly why this guy stuck in this uh, evolution of, of plants in here. I tried to figure out what he's meaning here, and I couldn't also, um, I couldn't also see it. But my, my, my understanding is that, um, <laughs> as we said, often when I find situations like this, I, I ask myself, OK, what do plants do to climate? And I know, as we just understood, that they produce oxygen, they regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a problem today. And so when you think of the evolution of plants, if it falls in natural, as natural cause, natural long-term changes, it could be because of natural factors that affect the existence of this vegetation. And so it causes them to, um, it causes them to, to, to be extinct, to no longer exist. And some of the natural causes is, as we said, if you have natural changes in solar activity, what you have to understand is that some of the causes of climate change, they don't, they don't, they don't happen isolatedly. If the solar activity changes, temperature is going to change and it's going to affect, affect certain plants. It's going to affect ecosystems, animals, marine environment, terrestrial environment. So it's, it's, it's a whole length, it's, it's a chain. It affects all this. Um, even though we're giving this lecture in a rush, but these are lectures you could stay and, like I said, these are actually areas of expertise. Some guys are, are just experts in climate change. It's a very, very 
huge and bus, uh, bus area. So um, to solve that, that issue here, um, we can look around other things, even volcanic activities. Um, if there's uh, one of the volcanic activities that took place in, in Congo, um, I think that was in 2005, uh, Mount, no not Mount, what is that, uh, I've forgotten the name, but the lava that was flowing there, very hot, fiery, destroyed all the vegetation along its path. And so what happens is that the chances of them revegetating is very slim. For some of them, they may not, it takes years for some of them to actually regenerate. And within those years that it's taken to regenerate, to come up to a level where they can be able to regulate the amount of carbon in the atmos atmosphere, something will be happening to the climate. So um, that is a, a way of expanding that, that, that evolution. I'm just trying to help a guy who tried to cover his, his, his head over what he put there as um, evolution of, of, of plants. Okay, uh, thank you for picking that up. Um, the next slide is talking about the dryosphere, the young dryosphere. It's a warm, it was a warm period. Remember we said um, climate change took place in terms of glacial and interglacial. We have cold periods and warm periods. You have glacial period and period when the glacier melted. So the young drier period is a, is a period in Europe which was warm, it led to the melting of ice and it brought about um, uh, hot conditions, warm conditions leading to heat and still bringing heat to Europe. Um, you can read this stuff, I don't want to go into that. So I just want to talk about that. And then um, in Southern Africa, the climate has changed radically in the past also and the predictions are that it will change in the future. So we have climate, climate change in Northern Europe, we have climate change in, change in Southern Africa. If you go to, to Europe, they have their periods and they've named them in different ways. Like we have the young dryer period, uh, the young period in, in Europe. In South Africa, we don't have the young dryer period. So um, in South Africa, we have but a series of warm and cool climates, or sometimes they call them uh, different names that we have around the world. You have glacier, glaciers which already have been, and interglacier, and they have some of them called pluvia, pluvia periods, and interpluvias. Interpluvias. You have some, we call it cool and warm, warm climate. In South Africa, we fall mostly along here. Um, we have what you call cool, dry periods and warm, moist periods. So this are hot this are cold period is one to just put it cold and these are hot or warm. So as you said, South Africa has had its own share as well. Now the question is how do we know how climate has changed in the past? How did this because some of the, the climate change as we see, it says here, measurements for for Climate, that is surface air temperature, sea level pressure uh, in Southern Africa, is available for the past 150 years. If you go to the past 150 years in South Africa, we have scientists, um, guys, intelligent guys who were able to study these things here. And then sometimes, if you look ahead, it tells us that there are three major ice periods in South Africa, and one of them. Uh, that took place several million years ago, and now I told them million years, two thousand million years ago. Who was there? <laughs> <laughs> so how did they? The question is, how did they come to know about these changes that took place millions of years, and tell us as if they know exactly what happened? How did they get this information? Sorry. They trace. Like global climate at that time. Yeah. And looking at the climate change. How do they look at the climate change at that time? That's no, no, the no, question. No, no, no. <laughs>
So, how do these guys know that? My question, the answer is in the notes. I just want to find out. Um, sorry? Paleoclimate, they study paleoclimate. That's perfect. Excellent. How do they study paleoclimate? Fossils. They look at fossils. Very good. They study fossils? Apart from fossils, what do they study? They study rocks? Um, in other words, the date, they, they take those, those, these materials, it could be radiocarbon, they take them to the laboratory and measure, and using different techniques in the laboratory, they can be able to tell for how long. They can, sometimes, they, if you go to sediments in, in um, let me take you into one of the few trips that before, I'm just quickly going to go to that and then I'll come back to, um, to, to, um, to this. This is the field trip that we had over the weekend, the one I went for, um, when I told you guys we didn't have a lecture on Friday because we went with the um, medical students to uh, uh, Eastern Cape and uh, study erosion for those of you who are doing soil erosion and land degradation in South Africa. And I just want to zoom into um, one of the slides uh, that contains some information. Um, as I was discussing with a student, um, I think it should be here. Let me see. Okay. We took another one which was uh, really raining. Okay. That was a lot. We stayed. If I don't find what I'm looking for, I will see this cost anyway. What do you, what do you have? Okay, I think that's the one. There's a particular... students when you do field observation and as, as we said if you want to become in the future a scientist or not a scientist a researcher you've got to start training your skills now and um, it shouldn't just be about you coming to do models and get um, and, and get uh, credit <laughs> and as we were doing the students they were looking at all these gullies that you see in there and they destroy the landscape you can't build in a place where these things happen you can't even have farms there this is a problem to development. So it needs you guys who are in this department, environmental science, agriculture, environmental sciences, to solve, they look to you to solve this problem, to tell them what's going on and how they can handle it. And that's why you're here. And so as we were moving and the students were astounded at what's going on, I said, and then the, we were two, two lecturers, there's a professor from, uh, from Peter Marisberg, Professor Heinz, and um, so we, we told the students, Look at the walls, look at the structures that you saw there. The people you can see, engineers struggle to build um, those gabion walls, those stone walls to try to prevent this from happening. But still, the thing is just carrying on. The natural forces don't care about what the people are doing. They are just doing that their own thing. Which shows that humans, even those guys, engineers, who have studied at the university, do not understand what is going on in here. And these structures they put in there, the river is just eroding everything and pushing it away. Again, that is the result of people coming to university and getting degrees, <laughs> <laughs> which we can even use. Ooh. We, we here want to get out of that. The generation have to get out of that. And so as the students were looking at the walls and so on, as, uh, the one student I pulled him aside, I, and that's why he took these photographs, because I, I, he, this is, he took all of this and then he transferred it to my um, USB. And I said, look at the wall, what do you see? Um, you know, on train ice. 
And, and th that is what I want to show you now. What you see in this wall here is actually he took part of it. What you see here is, um, you can see this very coarse grain sediment that the devil deposited. And then there is another layer on top there and a layer below here. And then below here there is another layer that you can see here. But what is interesting is that you find this layer here. This layer here tells you that this deposition took place at a certain climate. A certain amount of rainfall. The one on the top took place during a different... Uh, so, on, on the earth, you can study climate change. This tells me about climate change. At one period, this was the climate. The climate changed, then something happened. A certain form of deposition took place. A certain amount of discharge, regular geomorphology. A certain amount of sediment was deposited. After that, the climate changed again and a different, different uh, material was, was deposited. So, that comes back to the question that I asked. How do you study climate? Past climate. This is an example. You have the record sitting there. You move on. As, as I, feel, I tell you guys, when I travel, my eyes are open. And I enrich myself. I can look at things and it's so interesting. It makes, to me, this is quality of life. I don't need to get a good car and big house and whatever. But the fact that I know these things happen, to me, it's, it's a change in my life. It's, it's an improvement. It's a development. And, and so, I was telling the student, how do you know what has been happening here? When did this happen? When did that happen? When did that happen? Now, there are different methods which we are going to talk about. I'm just going to talk about it here before we get there. Um, so that when we get to that slide, I'll just go past that slide. The one, one way of studying this thing would be a radiocarbon. You can use radiocarbon dating. Radiocarbon dating. And the, one of the... Um, you have C14. They often write it like that. You see the 14 on top. Carbon dating. And what they do is that during this, this deposition, during this time of deposition, often the layer below is the oldest. The youngest layer is the one on the top. This was deposited and then later on that deposit and then the other one. So if I want to find out how old this layer is, I may have to, um, you realize that this is already the gully that has been cut by, by erosion. If I go on top, um, if I excavate a hole, dig a pit on top, right down to this level, on the back side of this gully, I will be looking for leaves, I will be looking for bones of animals that were buried, I will be looking for branches of trees that were buried, because they contain carbon. If I take this carbon to the laboratory and date them, they will give me how old they've been sitting in that place. And that approximately gives me the time when this thing happened, when they were buried. If I find, if I go up here and look for another carbon within this layer, and on top there, so if I have one carbon material here, one over there, and one over there, I can date all of them, and I'll have a different one year here, another different year over there, another different year over there. And I must tell you, some of these years go to thousands of years. That is how they get these things of millions of years and so on, because they use these different methods of dating. So we talk of carbon-14, another one. In most cases, what question that I needed somebody to ask is, what if I go through this profile and I don't see any carbon material in there? So how then do I date it? There are different other methods that I use. The one I'm going to talk about is, they call it thermoluminescence. Thermoluminescence. Another one is, I've just forgotten the name, but it's the, uh, the acronym. It's called OSL, it's something simulated. I've forgotten what this one, this O here stands for. Simulated. Luminescence. Luminescence is this, this over here. Maybe you should just go and try to find out that. And as I said earlier on, that's the one I use in my, my doctoral thesis. Um, what, what, and how does it work is that um, the, the, the knowledge behind it is that when this material was deposited, immediately it is covered 
it starts to absorb some kind of radiation on the earth and store that radiation. So when you go to collect this, this, this data here, what you do is that you clean this wall, you have a pipe, an iron pipe which is hollow, you hit into that wall there, and as you hit, as it goes into it, the soil comes out of the pipe. So the, the soil that is sitting behind that pipe, inside, is collected at the end of that pipe. And what you do is that when you pull out that pipe, in between the pipe there is uh, some amount of sediment that is sitting in there that has not been exposed to sunlight. If you take that to the laboratory, and uh, under some con laboratory conditions, if you take out, um, cut and take out that, that, those sediment that has not been uh, uh, exposed to sunlight, and measure the amount of uh, radiation that was stored in there, um, from the earth, it will give you how long the soil has been sitting there. Thermal luminescence, or uh, I've forgotten that, that name, but it's called OSF. And you can do that all through. Very expensive. When I send my samples to the US, uh, they charge me, there were four samples, 40,000 rand. 10,000 rand for one sample. That's how expensive it is, excluding the transport, exportation, uh, sending it to. That was the cheapest. The Austra Australians, uh, when I went, I asked the, the, it took me two years to want to get the funds. And about two and a half years, two, uh, altogether two and a half years to find, get the funds, and um, which laboratory would be able to do it at a cheaper rate. The Australians, it was how many years, thousand Australian dollars, which was about 15,000 rand for one sample. And in addition to that, they wanted me to get a visa for the sample. <laughs> the UK uh, requested me to send the samples, but they charged me in pounds. Converted to South African, it was almost about 20,000 rand per sample. So those are the things you go through. You those are items of research. Yeah, there's that part of money coming in, but the stress part is what I didn't tell you. <laughs> yeah, there are times that you can actually get stressed. The point here is not to tell you about whatever I went through, but it's the fact that that is how I updated the samples in the area in Pumalanga. The one sample there in the garden that I did it, uh, tells me that um, things that happened there was about 2,500 years ago, and the latest there was about 400 years ago. I didn't know it to be there 400 years ago to see what's happened. 2,500 Yes, probably there was nobody in South Africa who could even study anything and who saw the thing happen. But the soil told me that something happened there. And it helped, um, this information helped very much in solving a problem uh, there because um, we are not going to go into that because there's no time for that. Why is this shutting up now? Uh, we need to finish this lecture and this thing must stop playing our games. So we done the lecture for what? Okay. Anyway, let's let's move away from this and get back to our lecture. Um, so uh, we talked about those three ice ages. You can read them. What I want to explain here is this thing here called tea light. Very interesting. Found light. almost everywhere around. Especially where I found those rocks, especially in, around the Inanda Komatsu area. I wanted to show you an example, but I think one of my USB is somewhere. Actually, they, they call it Dwaika. You may want to go and find out. Just Google them. When you Google, look for images. Go to Google. When you go to Google, <laughs> then click the icon here that says images. <laughs> <laughs> Why I say so is because when you look at those rocks, when you look at those rocks, you see rounded boulders, pebbles sitting inside there. It's a massive rock but rounded boulders sitting in there. And this in here is a kind of a, a material that looks like mud, a solidified mud. <laughs> With rounded boulders in there. And, sorry, and they are massive rocks. The question is, how did they form? That is very interesting. Conclusive evidence that Southern Africa, even in KwaZulu Natal, that had glacier at one point. Those are glacier seals. Those are materials that were eroded by glacier, pushed down by glacier, and this rounded T 
tells you that they were rocked over the ground as they were as the glacier moved, and when the glacier stopped and the period came when the when the glacier melted, that mud that was eroded by glacier along with this period was solidified and formed this rock. So South Africa once had the glacier period. Excellent. This, this, the result is just there out there in the field, you can see. So there's nobody who can tell us, no, this thing they're telling about ice ages in South Africa, did it happen? No, we see a lot of rain around. No, it happened. It's sitting right there. As I told students this last weekend, when you move around, the rocks you see around, the gullies you see around, when you open your eyes and look at them, they are a library. It's an outdoor library. You go in there, you read books, the earth and natural forces have written their own books and they're sitting out there on the ground in valleys and rocks. You have to use your eyes to read it. Um, so let's, let's move ahead and see how far we can move around this. So it's the same story. Of course, when they talk about uh, Precambrian, the Cambrian period, how do you know when was Precambrian or Cambrian period? That's why they put this uh, time scale here so that you can see which one was the tertiary quaternary period. We are up there at the quaternary period. This is our period. The Cambrian is down here, and these are the years here to help you to understand what these notes are talking about. We talked about coal and warm periods. Something that I want to talk about here is this BP. It simply means before present. Before present. For example, when I dated my rocks here, um, that's the date given me today. If I come back to 2,500 years, or I would say my rock is how old? is 2,000 years before the present. And if I calculate today's 2013 and I calculate backward, it tells me where, it, where that period is. Maybe it will be during the time of before Christ, even before Christ was born. <laughs> so don't, don't say, this is not before Christ, it's before the present. That's why I highlighted that. Why I'm not talking about that, that uh, slide is because the, those are just straightforward words. You can read them, it's very easy to understand. That's why I'm not talking about it. We talked about how do you know climate, how do we measure climate. I told you about two methods of uh, looking or studying past climate. We talked about radiocarbon, radiocarbon dating. Then we talked about thermoluminescence or osmo. Now, I just forgot this one yet. Stimulated uh, luminescence. Other methods that we haven't talked about are, okay, the sediments that we talked about, that is your thermoluminescence and your OSF. That's how you measure sediments. Um, isotopes, you can also measure isotopes as another method. In the, eye, in the case, and this is sediment, taking cores. You take a core by using a certain material that is very long, it's quite like a pipe, a hollow pipe. If you, if you hit that pipe into deep sea sediment, and you pull out that pipe, often it's not by hitting. That pipe is, it has a handle, you screw it in. And what happens is that the soil gets stuck into that pipe. And if you pull it in, that becomes a core. Then you can see um, all those sediments, those layers of sediment. You can measure them and it tells you what happened in that sea for over how many years. So that is one way of measuring. And as we said, one way of another is by looking at isotopes that have accumulated in this uh, in this ice, in the case, they call them isotopes, stable isotopes. Oh. Level. So, but because of um, this thing was 
just jumped on me. I had to get, I had to do something <laughs> for you guys to understand something. So I'm tiptoeing the notes. Um, I don't know why this guy put this slide here, but I think that, I think the reason is because he wants to show that um, in modern pri recent climate change, one way of of, of knowing that climates have changed recently is by looking at the polar ice caps. If you go to Greenland, the size of ice that is sitting on the ice cap has actually reduced. It has melted. That's the best example. Another example that we have in Africa is actually Mount Kilimanjaro. The amount of ice that used to be there has actually just decreased. That is, that is clear evidence that climate change is happening. It is not a theory as people are uh, talked about it. So that's what I'm going to talk about, say about this slide. Uh, Some other evidence, apart from the uh, reduction in the uh, amount of ice in Greenland, in Kilimanjaro, maybe Mount Everest, and so on, is that we have frequent floods, rainfall, and, and droughts. In South Africa, is more floods than than, than um, more frequent floods that we have. Recently, there was in, in Kruger National Park, um, and then there was one again. I think it was in Bloemfontein, then in some parts of KwaZulu Natal. And the last weekend, when did it happen? In the Eastern Cape. And as I told you guys that uh, being there and seeing it happen was quite interesting. So uh, I'm just going to show you some of those uh, plots. You can, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's start from, there's even a movie here. He, this guy is going to one of these, uh, okay, no time for that. <laughs> you know, some students go to the future. This guy, we left on Friday. This guy was drinking the whole Friday, <laughs> Saturday, and he just passed out in the car. And then <laughs> <laughs> That's the blood there. Actually, this road, this road was completely covered with flood, and somewhere along here, it was completely covered with flood, and uh, you can see this electric pole submerged. No fish. <laughs> okay, that's what I was talking about. You can see this side of the road. One side of the road has completely been flooded. At least there are a bunch. <laughs> see this side, that sign there? In fact, there are more See, that's what we're talking about. Um, the worst one has still to come, so that was our bus there. You can see our bus was just moving. Um, what, what is so interesting is that the flood was mounting so much that um, at this stage here, you can see the flood is, has not covered all the road. As we stood there and were marveling at what was going on and so on, just within a few periods, a few times, the whole the, the thing just it was just flooding, it was just mounting. And I want to show you more serious cases. Um, when I came back and I gave this to the <laughs> property flooded, look at all this wave. It was so I remember one of the students was so frightened that she sat in the car and didn't want to come out. Because it wasn't, it was the sight to behold, to see this this waves in the in a normal river that just simply flows. Now it becomes so turbulent and the waves are, and it was just on a. Um, the worst scenario I just want to show you uh, another scenario that is even worse than. The residents came out and were watching. The police even was it was an emergency situation. I just want to show you. Yeah, well, this is the entire field trip, so. <coughs> when are we having our. Uh, yeah, that's one of the this, this is the ones I'm talking about. Those houses are being flooded. <laughs> Uh, you know students. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny about this? Why is she laughing? <laughs> 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 
So, that's what we are talking about. Present climate change is happening right now. This last weekend we talked about. These are things that we see happening around. Um, something here, sorry guys. There is a reason. As I said, these are not my notes. So as I go through and I see questionable things, I just flag them. There's a reason why I put double question mark here. It's not sitting in your notes. Uh, because it says in the last 20 years, trend towards uh, reduced rainfall. There have been trends towards reduced rainfall. I'm actually talking about the situation in Southern Africa. And during the early 1990s, um, the third serious drought occurred. But I have put a question, looking at what we just saw and what we have seen happening also in Kruger National Park where it happened recently in Bloemfontein area, in Mozambique uh, recently also, um, and then trends to reduce rainfall, that's why I put a question mark, I don't know. That depends on when these notes were, were, were de developed. <laughs> uh, I, I would disagree somehow with, with that point. Because we have more rainfall now. In fact, we talked about climate change prediction, uh, not uh, climate change. Um, yeah, climate change forecast, not forecast. Forecast is weather prediction of climate change in the past, in the in the, in the few and in the years to come. Experts say that climate change will affect different regions differently around the world. Some e some areas will have droughts. That's why they will have droughts. And at the same time, while some people are suffering with no rainfall and drought, extreme dry condition, others will be suffering from heavy rainfall and floods. And South Africa is placed in the region where there will be more rainfall and actually uh, more, um, more floods. That's why I see put a question there. Maybe if the lecturer was here, he would explain this differently. I don't know. That's why I see put a question mark there. Not, I don't think he's the way he just got it also from some, somewhere. <laughs> So climate change, when we talk of future climate change, what cause, what, some, when we talk of future climate change, we are looking actually at temperature changes, um, which could fluctuate, um, and sometimes it, is, it says the normal, the natural fluctuation is between that, uh, and sometimes smaller fluctuations, that would be a situation. It is very, very important that we monitor climate change. Why? Because of planning. Because of planning, quite interesting. You saw those uh, that around the veil that was submerged. Those are actually touristic facilities. Those are lodges. <laughs> so that guy's business is. And then you saw those other rural areas. In fact, it, it affected it. Most people there, sitting in a flat plain. Now the question is: the town planning officials, mm. when they were planning this, this settlement, what were they thinking? They didn't factor climate change into it. There you go. As you travel, that's just the kind of things as environmental students, students studying environmental sciences. That is where your eyes got, get, has to be open. And when you go out in future, out there, in your, in your own localities, where you come from, you are going to see this kind of decision being made, which will make you start questioning them. Um, so that is why we are saying that when you monitor climate change and see what is going to, as what we saw happening. If you had some of you, uh, some of the students live here and they go to do their masters in town planning, now you can be able to factor that when it comes to planning. Areas that are sitting in flat plains, you have to tell people evacuate this area, put a buffer zone where no construction should take place and where the construction should take place and, and, and so on. And um, just what you said there, the quest, something that you mentioned here about um, how people uh, would make such decisions, sometimes it's because of bribery. Somebody comes here, I want to put it in here so that people can, you know, lodges, people can come and stay here and just see the river over here and make money. So, uh, and then they go to town, town planning officials, mayor and so on, and they give him a part sum of money. And he, he say, okay, just go and view. No impact assessment is made, no studies, no regulations, no permits, and so on and so forth. Those kind of things happen. They come with jobs like that to my office and they talk to me. I remember one of them one of these Tugela River. Somebody wanted to do uh, a kind of a poultry farm and they came us 
came to see us to do environmental impact assessment uh, so that they can get environmental authorization and permit to do uh, the poultry. When we um, told them the process to go through, they refused. <laughs> what they did was that they went to the local chief there and he gave them the go ahead and because uh, that particular area somewhere comes from uh, the president, uh, they went to the president, somehow got close to him, get, he gave authorization, and then they avoided the entire legal process. Um, I have a student who was employed by Monday. Um, at, um, he finished master's here, this environmental science. I just, I'm giving you this experience to show how some students, when they study in this environment and when they leave, because they've been, they've, they've been enlightened, they don't allow money to bribe them. Some of you, yeah, you finish and separate will give you a big chunk of money, car and all the privileges and like, I need money. You go and sit with them and they're ruining the environment and you shut your mouth because you earn the money. But not all students. This student was in, employed by uh, Monday and uh, Monday was under-reporting some of the environmental problems they were causing and hiding some of them. This guy, he resigned. He said, I'm an environmentalist, I study this thing here, it's bugging my conscience, I cannot be eating money that I'm not sleeping well, I'm not even enjoying the money. He resigned, he filed in his, uh, his nation and he was quit. Mm -hmm. 